Hello, and welcome to the Young Onset Parkinson's Disease, You're Not Alone uh, Symposium, an event that we put together for us all. Uh, this is hosted by the Parkinson's Foundation, Carolina's chapter in collaboration with Duke Health Movement Disorder Center and the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill School of Medicine and the Parkinson's Foundation Center of Excellence. My name is J.R. Russell, and I'm here today because first of all, I have young onset Parkinson's disease. Let me just tell you a little bit about myself and my journey that has brought me to this point. Back in uh, 2009, I began experiencing symptoms in my right shoulder. I just thought it was a baseball injury from throwing too many fastballs. Thought the rotator cuff was going out and I needed to have something done. But soon after that, it started down into uh, traveling from my right arm shoulder down to my elbow, down into my hand. And then a few months later, I noticed that it was hard for me to be able to move my right leg. And I had that feeling whenever I was sitting or standing that my foot, my right foot was glued to the floor. So that was in 2009, but I was in a big transition with my family and my career. And it took three years before I finally really found the time to be able to look into what was really going on with me. In 2012, I had an appointment to see a neurologist because I had gotten to a point to where I was not functioning very well. It was difficult for me to move. It was difficult for me to type. It was difficult for me to write. I was tired and I didn't know what was going on in my life. Well, in 2012, February, I was diagnosed by my neurologist with young onset Parkinson's disease. He prescribed some medications for me. I took them and that helped tremendously. It brought back some function to my right arm and my right leg. And because I was working full-time and still working full-time today, but at that time, I just carried on with my life, trying to act as normal as possible with my medications and managing things at home and at work. Well, after about four to five years of that experience, I knew that there needed to be a change because I was not necessarily doing that well. And so I sought out an opportunity to get involved in the Parkinson's community here in the greater Raleigh area. And it really changed my life. I connected with folks who were doing this boxing program calling Rock Steady Boxing. And I went for the first time and it made a huge difference in my life. Not only was it physically helpful for me, but it was emotionally helpful for me it was socially helpful for me and it was psychologically help, helpful for me as well. That was about three and a half to four years ago that I began that journey of getting connected with the Parkinson's community. And then as a result of the rock steady boxing, I got involved in a support group that helped address some personal needs. And I met some other people who were just like me, who were struggling with Parkinson's disease and we're wondering what the future was about. So I'm really excited to be a part of this event because for us as with young onset Parkinson's, we're a small minority of the population of Parkinson's patients in the US and around the world. And I'm looking forward to what, what we're gonna be able to hear and see and do today together as we go on this journey together with young onset Parkinson's disease. Now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Deanna Parrish. She's the development director for the Parkinson's Foundation's Carolina chapter. Take it away, Deanna. Thanks so much, Jay, um, I'm JR. I I'll tell you, JR is an inspiration and continues to be throughout the Carolinas, particularly in the Raleigh area. Um, he, I work with him and probably 50 other volunteers throughout the Carolinas who either have Parkinson's disease or are caregivers or family member. Um, it's exciting what we do with the Parkinson's Foundation. 
just to let you all know, our mission really is to make life better for people living with Parkinson's and improving care and advancing research. Now I share this with all of you because I'm gonna take off my staff hat and let you all know my husband was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2006. So my position is truly a calling and my goal is to educate, empower and engage the Parkinson's community throughout the Carolinas. And I'm gonna tell you a few ways that we do do that. Next, Parkinson's Foundation, you can get in touch with us. The Carolinas chapter was just formed. Uh, we had our first meeting in August. We have amazing board members. That is our website, parkinson.org backslash Carolinas. For those of you living in the Carolinas, please visit the website. You'll be amazed at all the events and programs and information that we have available for you. We also have a Facebook page. Close to 700 people are following us. It's, it's a lot of fun. We are uh, part of, we give out community grants, not the Carolinas chapter, but nationally, the foundation gives out community grants. Last year, the Carolinas received seven grants and these were for people like, uh, one was for power moves. Another one was for dance, um, great programs, movement programs, a lot of them for people with Parkinson's. And we gave out, we got over 97,000 in grants last year. In the Carolinas, we're busy. We have three moving day events. Two of them are coming up, one in Charleston and one in Winston-Salem. And in the fall, we have one in Raleigh. Today is an example of the educational program that we offer. Hey everybody, our lives have changed. I wish I was in person talking to 150 people in a room. I love the energy, but this is how we're doing it now, virtually with Zoom. And I gotta tell you, we've made a lot of new friends across the country through the virtual component. So I don't see that going away. We'll probably do a hybrid. As uh, JR mentioned, um, we have three centers of excellence. Now centers of excellence are Universities with, that have research and hospitals throughout the country, we have 34, Duke, UNC, and Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston are recognized as one of the 34 that provide outstanding care for people with Parkinson's disease. And the biggest thing, and you'll learn this today, is called a movement disorder specialist. They specialize in working with people with Parkinson's. And that picture there, by the way, are my two daughters and my husband. And that's why we, on this journey, um, we're making the best of it for 16 years and it's been, it's been okay. Next. Just to let you know, if you go on the website, you will see every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, the Parkinson's Foundation hosts Health at Home virtual programs. Our next Carolinas chapter, and really now it's grown to a national program, will be for veterans in Parkinson's. We have um, almost 600 people registered for that. We realize that 110,000 veterans live with Parkinson's disease and there's a million that we estimate in the country. So over 10% are veterans. So we realize we have to do something for the veterans. And uh, getting expert care, Eastern North Carolina, if any of you live in Eastern North Carolina, this is a special program to help you create a roadmap, your journey, uh, learn about the resources. And we know it's challenging because many areas do not have the resources, but we're gonna help. Next, please. These are the moving days I referred to. Uh, let me just share this with you. I started as a volunteer leader and chaired the inaugural moving day Winston-Salem event in 2018. We had over 400 people, my husband, Bubba, got up on the stage and looked out and cried. Bubba was diagnosed at 56, so not necessarily young, young onset, but moving day is magical. It's magical and you learn a lot and you learn that you're not alone when you're in person. Unfortunately, we're gonna have two virtual events in April and May, but hopefully moving day NC Triangle will be in person. Next, please. PD Generations. This is something that when I learned about it, being a care partner, phenomenal new initiative. It's free genetic testing for people with Parkinson's disease. 
So there is a lot more information. You can sign up if you have Parkinson's disease, get the genetic test. You can either go to Center of Excellence or we now, because of what's going on with pandemic, you can get the kit mailed to you at home. I know Bubba, we are going to participate in this because we wanna find out, does he carry one of the seven mutations? Most don't, it's 10 to 15% that do, but, and it also will help with research. This is a significant initiative that will help with research across the country. Next, please, Annie. Okay, uh, resources. We will send this all to you, parkinsons.org, um, or you can call our helpline. We have educational books. That's how we got started in 2006 with all the books that were offered and they're amazing. Webinars, the helpline, um, fact sheets, the moving days. At moving day, we do educate, you know, empower, engage and educate. Uh, so if you can't attend a moving day in your area. Next, please. Sponsors, okay. I'm gonna tell you, this is one thing that I also love about the foundation. All of these things that we do are free. There is no cost to anybody, except for there is a professional training, but other than that, and it's because of our sponsors. So I would like to thank Amnil, Synovian, Kiwa Curran, Acadia, Supernus, and Accorda. Go on our website, uh, Carolina's chapter website, click on the um, chapter supporters, you can click on their link and it'll take you directly to what it is that they offer for people with Parkinson's. Next, please. You can go ahead and go, to, there you go. It is my pleasure right now to introduce Dr. Skleroff, who is with the UNC uh, Center of Excellence, and she will talk to you more about young onset and what you need to know. Thank you, Dr. Skleroff. Thank you. Um, and I'm just queuing my slides here. Okay, well, hello, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I am Dr. Skleroff. I am a movement disorder specialist at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And um, I'm going to be offering kind of an overview about young onset Parkinson's disease. And um, it's going to be a lot of information in a short period of time. Um, and I'm trying to, uh, I try to address a lot of the topics that I know are important to people living with young onset Parkinson's disease. Um, but of course, we'll have a Q&A session at the end and I'm more than happy to answer any questions um, that you have either seeding from what we talked about, what I mentioned, or um, you know, if you had something else that was burning that you wanted to make sure we discussed today. Okay, so first, what is young onset Parkinson's disease? Well, we know that Parkinson's disease typically starts to affect people in their 60s. That's the most common time that people will start to have symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Uh, but there is a smaller subset of people who start to have symptoms earlier than that. Most of us, most movement disorders doctors will define young onset Parkinson's disease as Parkinson's disease symptoms that start before the age of 50. Um, there is a little bit of controversy about exactly what age we consider young onset. There are some, um, some researchers especially who may define it as younger than age of 40 or younger than age 45. So there's not, a total consensus, however, for the most part, we are in agreement that younger than age 50 is what we consider young onset Parkinson's disease. And for us, that for those of us that treat Parkinson's disease, when we see someone who starts to have symptoms before the age of 50, our um, treatment mind frame is going to be that of young onset Parkinson's disease, which we're about to talk about. And the estimation is that maybe five to 10% of all people in the Western hemisphere who have Parkinson's disease will have had onset before the age of 50, which you can see is kind of a small number. Um, you know, there's some contra there may be a little bit higher numbers um, in the far in, in, in the East, um, in Asia, but that's still the, the jury's out on that. Okay. Well, Oh, this is blocking my screen. How do I get rid of this? Okay. So I'm so sorry. I can't get rid of this little thing at the top. 
away. There we go. Uh, so how is young onset Parkinson's disease different from later onset, meaning after the age of 50? Well, people who have symptoms starting before the age of 50, we expect them to have a much longer disease duration, meaning they're going to be living with Parkinson's for a lot longer than our patients, for example, who start having symptoms in their 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, in fact, we expect them to be living with Parkinson's for 20, 30, even 40 years or longer. We do see slower progression of symptoms in our young onset Parkinson's group. Uh, so not only do we expect them to be living your to be living with Parkinson's for a lot longer, we do notice that um, as time goes on, of course, we do see progression in all of Parkinson's, but in our young onset Parkinson's disease uh, group, we see it much slower over time. We also do see a slightly higher rate of a genetic predisposition to Parkinson's among our younger onset uh, group. And as Diana mentioned, uh, for the most part, we can, we see uh, a genetic cause of Parkinson's or genetic predisposition to Parkinson's in somewhere around 10% of pe all people with Parkinson's. In our genetic group, or excuse me, in our young onset group, we do see that number a little bit higher. Um, one way we kind of figured this out was uh, we were finding that more people with young onset Parkinson's disease had family members who also were affected with Parkinson's. Um, there are some large genetic studies now that have looked at young onset Parkinson's disease, and we do see a slightly higher rate of some of these genes that, that we've identified as contributing to Parkinson's disease. That being said, I do want to make sure that it's clear that the majority of people with Parkinson's, including the majority of people with young onset Parkinson's disease, still do not have a known genetic cause. And uh, you know, we, we still are, uh, for the most part, dealing with an idiopathic condition, Parkinson's, uh, meaning it's not something that's passed down from generation to generation for most people. Uh, another difference um, between young onset Parkinson's and later onset Parkinson's is how people present, meaning what do they look like? What are the symptoms that really make them come to see a neurologist in the first place? For young onset Parkinson's disease, we are much more likely to see people coming in with uh, noticing stiffness, rigidity in one side of the body or one limb. Uh, sometimes we'll see muscle cramping and even pain. Uh, in our later onset group, we are more likely to see other symptoms like uh, walking problems, balance problems, gait instability. Uh, we see less of that early on in our young onset Parkinson's group. Um, there is some uh, evidence that maybe even tremor is a little more likely to happen in our, uh, uh, in our older patients when people start having symptoms a little bit later on. Well, so what are some challenges that are specific to young onset Parkinson's disease that we, that we um, really think about when we see our, our patients, our, our cohort, um, who has start having symptoms before the age of 50? Well, one major issue that we deal with is the fact that when people are having symptoms of Parkinson's before the age of 50, there is a higher impact on productivity. And we really, think about things like occupational challenges. A lot of our folks who are having symptoms before the age of 50 are still working, right? We still are in the prime of our jobs where some of us are in early career stages, some of us are in middle career stages, but typically we are in um, a highly productive part time of, of our lives. There's also consideration of the family role. People who are diagnosed be before the age of 50 often may have young children or children who are still living at home. They may be in a role of caregiving for an elderly family member or a neighbor. Um, so of course, Parkinson's presents challenges to those roles. And then of course, there's a social impact. People who are uh, before the age of 50 uh, tend to be leaders in their community. They tend to have uh, prominent roles in society, they tend to be very active in society, um, more so than let's say our folks who start having symptoms in their 60s or 70s, who may be retired, who may not, most likely probably don't have children still living at home, um, and are less likely to be primary caregivers for, uh, you know, an elderly uh, family member. 
Um, the social impact we also have to keep in mind, some of our young onset Parkinson's folks may be young, um, young enough or maybe in a stage in their lives where they may still be dating. And of course, having symptoms of Parkinson's can present challenges there as well. We also have found that our young onset Parkinson's uh, folks have a greater impact on quality of life. The symptoms of Parkinson's themselves seem to negatively impact quality of life more so than what we see in our older, uh, our, our later onset folks. Um, and I'll come to that again a little bit later. Unfortunately, we do also see higher rates of depression among our young onset Parkinson's folks as, a, as a compared to our later onset Parkinson's. And there's probably many contributing factors to this. We suspect that maybe loss of productivity is one of the factors. As I mentioned before, there's more stress, uh, more job stress. Um, maybe people are worried about financial security, about losing their, their jobs, um, being able to be productive at work, being able to keep up with workload. Those can produce stress, which can then of course uh, affect mood. Um, we also see people having more uh, difficulty with uh, performing you know, caregiving roles, for example, in their family. Uh, and then of course, there's also the, the concerns that people have. Well, what does this mean for my family when I'm having symptoms this young? How am I gonna keep being able to provide or, or um, take care of my family? There's also um, a less discussed but equally important impact on sexual function. Uh, Parkinson's disease does have a negative impact on sexual function at any age, um, but we do see that that impact is more likely to affect people's um, mood and function early on, uh, earlier in life, right? Before the age of 50, uh, impact on sexual function can negatively impact, um, especially family, dating, all the things that we associate with younger onset Parkinson's disease. Um, so that is always something that we wanna make sure we address. We also see higher levels of perceived stigma in young onset Parkinson's disease. Um, and again, there may be multiple reasons for this. Symptoms of Parkinson's disease uh, often are things like stooped posture, shuffling gait, smaller steps, tremors. And these may be symptoms that in society we kind of think of as having to do with older age. But when our young onset Parkinson's uh, uh, patients are having these symptoms, uh, they may feel like, oh, these people are judging me or looking at me funny because they wouldn't expect someone like me to have these symptoms. Uh, so that may be one uh, area that, that may be contributing to why there are higher levels of perceived stigma. All of these items together, unfortunately, do seem to uh, produce higher levels of depression in our young onset folks. And then another major challenge that is specific to young onset Parkinson's is that we are more likely to see these motor fluctuations and dyskinesias. These two items, motor fluctuations and dyskinesias, are things that we see as, a, as an, a, excuse me, as a result of the medications that we use to treat Parkinson's. Motor fluctuations refers to um, when people can feel that the medication's in their system, and then of course they feel when it's out of their system. And uh, sometimes that results in having lots of ups and downs in the day in terms of function, in terms of um, how you're feeling, how you're moving, how you're walking, how you're able to do things. Uh, you know, minor motor fluctuations, often we can sort of deal with those and figure out how to, how to work around them, uh, but sometimes they can be quite severe and, and cause major limitations to function. Dyskinesias are the, the word we use to describe extra movements that come about usually, it's actually as a result of the medications, a side effect, uh, particularly of the carbidopa levodopa, which is the main uh, medication that we use to treat Parkinson's disease. Um, we the, the number one contributor to developing motor fluctuations and dyskinesias is just the duration of the, disease, of the disease. So the longer you've had Parkinson's, the more likely you are to develop these complications. Um, but we have found that even when we control for disease duration, meaning we kind of take that factor out, our young onset folks are still a little bit more likely to develop these 
um, sometime in the course of their, of their journey with Parkinson's as opposed to our later onset folks. Okay, well, and that leads me to, do we treat young onset Parkinson's differently than we do for people who have later onset of their symptoms? So uh, when I meet a new patient and we talk about starting treatment, the first thing I always make sure we discuss is disease modifying treatment as opposed to symptomatic treatment. By disease modifying, what I'm talking about is treatments that slow the progression of Parkinson's or you know, take it away from you. Obviously, we know at this point, we don't have a drug that takes it away from you. Um, not yet, we're working on it. There is a lot of very exciting research happening. Um, we don't also, we, as of now, do not have a drug that has been proven to slow down the progression of Parkinson's. However, one thing that we do know for certain is that exercise, cardiovascular exercise, and uh, higher levels of physical activity in general seem to slow down progression of the, of the disease, of the symptoms it's themselves, both motor symptoms, non-motor symptoms, cognitive symptoms. Um, so that is very important because for me, a main, the, one of the major goals of treating Parkinson's is going to be to make sure that people can stay active and are exercising. Symptomatic treatment is basically what we're doing with every drug that's available on the market for Parkinson's. Um, and symptomatic treatment also would include things like physical therapy, um, speech therapy, but the symptomatic treatment is aimed at improving or reducing symptoms of Parkinson's, okay? So that it's very important that those are two very different uh, um, approaches, you know, two different parts of treating Parkinson's disease. Now, the goal of symptomatic treatment is to maintain a necessary level of function. Uh, so all the medications that we recommend and that we decide whether or not it's worth trying, starting, keeping, increasing, decreasing, is really based on how you're doing. How are you functioning? In young onset Parkinson's disease, we have to be uh, very rigorous about this. Um, our young onset folks, we need to keep them active and exercising, but we also really need to keep track of, of their career, right, of their occupation. Most people who are, or not most, many people younger than age 50 are, like I mentioned, at, at peak times of their career, they're very productive. And of course, symptoms of Parkinson's can very much interfere with this. So when we are treating young onset Parkinson's disease, we really need to focus on how are we going to keep you working effectively for as long as possible. And we are uh, very, um, it, it's very important that we tailor treatment to be able to continue that level of function as, for as long as possible. Another, uh, as I mentioned, that same goes for caregiving. So people younger than 50 often have a caregiver role in their family, in their community. Um, and then people younger than 50 also tend to be more active in the community. And we ex would very much ex expect them or want them to stay active in the community, keep up those roles. Um, and this is different from later onset Parkinson's because for many people, um, you know, if they're diagnosed in their 60s or 70s, they may be retired. They may, uh, they're less likely to be giving, uh, be a primary caregiver for uh, a family member. It's not always true. Um, they often are a little bit less active in the community. That's again, not always true, but um, my point is that we have to really take these things into account when we're treating and young onset Parkinson's does present special challenges in that way. And I get asked a lot about lifestyle. Um, you know, in general for Parkinson's disease, as I mentioned, exercise is very important. It's one of the most important parts of treating Parkinson's. Um, and the, the type of exercise is less important than the fact that you are exercising. There's been a lot of studies and there's still a lot of studies going on trying to find what is the ideal exercise? How do we do it? You know, and, and so far the data shows that most types of exercises are equivalent. The most important thing is to actually get a cardiovascular workout, make sure you're breathing harder, having your heart rate go up when you're exercising, uh, make sure that you're doing a moderate level and uh, at least 30 to 45 minutes a day. Um, I usually say three to four days a week, but the more the better in that, in that case. Um, 
So if you find a type of exercise that you can do and you enjoy doing and that you will do, that is more important to me than what type of exercise it is. Um, now diet, I get asked a lot about diet. There is not one particular diet that has been proven to be perfect for Parkinson's, but we do know that it is important to have a balanced diet. Uh, we do worry about weight in Parkinson's disease because we know that having higher BMI, uh, obesity in particular can limit mobility, which when you have Parkinson's, you don't need other obstacles uh, for mobility. We also know that people with Parkinson's do tend to lose weight and being underweight, of course, presents its own set of problems. So we, we try very hard to make sure people are in kind of a normal BMI range. Um, we also very much encourage high water intake and high fiber intake. The reason for that is that uh, constipation is very common in Parkinson's disease and diet can be really the best way to keep that under control. Um, also low blood pressure or dropping blood pressure when people stand up is, is quite common in Parkinson's and drinking a lot of water can really help with that. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I get also asked a lot about um, how diet affects absorption of medication and especially the carbidopa levodopa. That's its own topic and I'm happy to, to discuss it if people have questions about it. But early on when we start treating people with carbidopa levodopa, we tell them do not worry about the diet because it's very unlikely that you'll notice uh, any interference with the medication. After people have been taking it for a long time, they may start to notice that if they eat a big meal, especially a meal that's filled with protein, the, their medication may not kick in quite as well. But we don't worry about that unless that's something that people start to notice, which is usually in a minority of, of people. And then sleep. Uh, sleep is obviously very important. Uh, and sleep, unfortunately, is often very disturbed in Parkinson's. We have lots of different factors that contribute to that. Uh, what we call fragmented sleep is very common in Parkinson's, uh, meaning people wake up a lot during the night. Sometimes they can get back to sleep easily, sometimes not so much. We also have things like REM sleep behavior disorder, which is when people act out their dreams that can interfere with sleep quality. Also what we call periodic limb movements of sleep where there'll be a little jerk of the leg or the arm uh, or sometimes a big jerk, um, which can also interfere with sleep quality. So there are lots of factors that, um, that can interfere with sleep. There's others, uh, you know, vivid dreams that people sometimes will have can interfere with sleep quality um, and dif sometimes difficulty turning in bed. Um, in our later onset Parkinson's group, uh, when people are sleepy during the day, we recommend that they take a nap. In our young onset Parkinson's group, especially people who are working, who have responsibilities with childcare, with caring for, for family members, that's not always possible. Uh, so we do address it a little bit differently and a little bit more aggressively in our young onset Parkinson's group as opposed to our later onset Parkinson's. And one major thing I wanna make sure that we discuss is that we do not delay carbidopa levodopa therapy. So carbidopa levodopa, some of you may know it as Cinemet, but carbidopa levodopa is the mainstay of treatment in Parkinson's. It is the strongest, most effective medication with the best uh, risk benefit ratio, meaning side effect to good effect uh, ratio. We used to think that delaying carbidopa levodopa therapy was a good thing to do because we were under the impression that when you start carbidopa levodopa, there's only a certain amount of time, let's say five years, where you get a really good effect from it and don't have some of these complications that I mentioned before, the motor fluctuations off and on and the dyskinesias, the extra movements. Well, what we found since then is that actually the number one a uh, risk factor for these fluctuations and dyskinesias is just the duration of the disease. So if we hold off on starting carbidopa levodopa therapy, we actually get a much smaller time window uh, of good effect before we start seeing complications, as opposed to starting it early when we get a much longer time uh, window where, where it's effective and we're not seeing as many of these complications. We also found that people's quality of life is much more negatively impacted in those years where they're still productive, where they're young, where they should be working, they should be taking care of family, they should be doing all these other uh, roles in the community that they were doing before they were diagnosed. 
And by delaying carbidopa levodopa therapy, we were having people not functioning. They were not functioning well. They were not able to keep up with all the things that they needed to do. And in the end, this led to worse outcomes. So now we know that we do not delay carbidopa levodopa therapy. When it's needed, we use it. And um, it, it's actually, we have much better outcomes in the end when we do that. But we do make sure that we keep the dose low and we advance it slowly. As I mentioned before, people with young onset Parkinson's disease will be living with Parkinson's for years and years, decades, for a long time. We do know that even though there isn't technically a ceiling to the dose of carpidopa levodopa that we use, uh, we do eventually, we have the potential of being limited and going up further if people start having side effects. And the higher the dose we go, the more likely it is that we'll get side effects. So for that reason, we try to keep the dose as low as we can while of course, keeping in mind the goal of treatment, which is maintaining a necessary level of function. Um, and we advance the dose very slowly, which honestly is not so difficult in young onset Parkinson's because as I mentioned before, it is very, it, it is slower progressing than what we see in our older, uh, later onset Parkinson's folks. We also um, often talk about how we have more ability to use alternative medications in our young onset folks. So there are many medications that we use to amplify the effects of the carbidopa levodopa. Uh, there are also other medications that we can use in addition to carbidopa levodopa or even on their own, such as the dopamine agonist medications uh, like pramipexol or ropinerol, also things like amantadine. Um, but there is a caveat. So people with young, uh, the, a lot of the side effects that we see with these alternative medications um, are things that can worsen cognition, make people confused. Um, there are other side effects that we tend to see more in our later onset Parkinson's when people, as people get older. However, there is one particular side effect with the dopamine agonists that we uh, do see more often in our younger group, and that is the impulse control disorders. The impulse control disorders are um, things like uh, impulsive gambling, or uh, online shopping more than you're really able to spend. Uh, some people even get into drugs. And these are, um, these are really impulsive type behaviors that are really out of, usually out of character for, for someone. Um, and that can be a side effect, a devastating side effect of these uh, dopamine agonists. So we always make sure to keep an eye on it, make sure we talk to people about it if we have patients who are taking those medications. And that is more common in the young onset group, um, especially in men, but we see it in, in both genders, in both sexes. And then deep brain stimulation. So um, I wanna make sure we talk about this. this is a big question for a lot of people. Um, deep brain stimulation is a surgical procedure where we implant little teeny tiny electrodes deep into the brain, into the basal ganglia region, which is uh, where a lot of motor symptoms of Parkinson's seem to be generated. These electrodes can be adjusted in terms of the voltage because we send uh, really small electrical pulses that seems to really improve motor symptoms of Parkinson's. The way we decide if someone should be getting the surgery or is eligible for the surgery is there's, there's many different hoops we, we go through, but the main thing we look for is that they actually do really well with the carbidopa levodopa medication. The medications help them a lot, but they're having some difficulty with the medication, either side effects or too many motor fluctuations. They're taking the medication very often during the day and having lots of ups and downs where, to the point where it's hard to function. Um, so those are, those are the, the major indications for, using, for doing deep brain stimulation. We do uh, actually, we know that we end up using deep brain stimulation more frequently in our young onset group um, at some point during the course of, of Parkinson's for them, uh, partly because they have a longer disease duration. So we have more time to, um, you know, go up on the medication doses and, and also because we know that they are more likely at some point to experience motor fluctuations and dyskinesias. Uh, we also are more likely to do it in our young onset group because of course this is brain surgery. So as people get older, they may have higher uh, surgical risk. 
you know, if you're having things, you have COPD and congestive heart failure and, you know, other things that may make it more dangerous for you to undergo anesthesia or, or surgery, uh, we are less likely to be um, recommending it. So our younger group is more likely to be healthy, less likely to have some of these complications that would make it hard to recommend them for surgery. And then in our young onset group, we also always have to remember um, about addressing non-motor symptoms. And this is true for all Parkinson's, all people with Parkinson's. We, when, when people who don't have Parkinson's think about Parkinson's, we, we usually think about the motor symptoms, the tremor, the shuffling, walking, the you know slowness. Uh, but those of us that are living with Parkinson's or treat Parkinson's, we know that there's a lot more than just the motor symptoms in Parkinson's. The non-motor symptoms can be just as debilitating, if not more debilitating. In young onset Parkinson's, the non-motor symptoms uh, that we especially need to make sure that we're addressing because they are more frequent are the mood and sexual side uh, effects of Parkinson's. Uh, as I mentioned before, depression and anxiety are more common in our young onset Parkinson's group than in our later onset Parkinson's group. Uh, so we really need to be vigilant about this, especially because we know that depression in Parkinson's does portend a, a poor prognosis for a lot of the benchmarks that we use when we're thinking about Parkinson's and treating Parkinson's. Okay, how, how did I do on time? Did okay. All right. So. Um, I'm happy to take questions. I'm gonna, should I stop sharing my screen? Yeah. Thank, great. Thank you, Dr. Sklerlov. Sure. Um, that was very informative and very helpful. Kind of one takeaway for me is about a nap. I've noticed for me that basically every day I need a nap in the afternoon in order for me to make it through the rest of the day in my evening. And as well, I can say on a personal note that Dr. Sklerlov is my personal neurologist at UNC Hospitals. In fact, I just saw her earlier this week. So it's great to see her and the great to hear her presentation. Incredible. Thank you so much. Thanks, so now we're going to take some, some questions from our audience. Uh, we've asked you to write, write, uh, send those in via text and so um, online chat. And so I have a question here for Dr. Skylov to start off. First question is, are there any short-term remedies for tremor? For example, when I'm nervous or have to speak in front of people with deep breathing or acupressure point or anything like that be of help to me besides uh, pharmaceuticals or taking medication? That's a good question. Uh, so there's a lot of layers. Um, so we, all, uh, whoever, if, if anyone is having, you know, it has Parkinson's, they know that all symptoms of Parkinson's seem to get worse if we're anxious, if there's stress, um, if there's a pressure of any sort, you can lock up. And if you have tremor in those moments, in, that, in those instances, the tremor gets worse. So performance, uh, what we call performance anxiety, uh, you know, is, is a real thing. It really does make the tremors, especially the tremors worse. Um, so really, you know, we do talk about any way to reduce stress surrounding uh, something that's going on or performance anxiety is going to, is, is going to help the tremor is going to reduce the tremor. Um, depending on the type of tremor, uh, you know, if it's, if it's a resting tremor as opposed to an action tremor, which we also sometimes will see in Parkinson's, we do treat it a little bit differently. Um, there's not really been any non-pharmaceutical um, intervention that's proven to work uh, for this um, anxiety pr uh, provoked tremor. Um, but I imagine that if, for example, if, if you're someone who meditates, and you find that meditation or, or even some of the yoga breathing exercises that we do, if that re helps reduce your stress, it will also help reduce the tremor. Um, but I do have a low threshold for, for offering small doses of medication um, that do help reduce uh, um, performance anxiety for my patients, especially people who do need to you know, be 
um, in front of a podium who are giving talks for work or for whatever uh, social engagements they have, uh, because it is such a big part of um, being able to function. Um, and there are lots of different medications that are, some are really benign, uh, some not so much, um, but we do have a lot of options for, for treating that. Excellent, excellent. Got another question for you. Does early onset uh, Parkinson's disease impact the same gene? And then a second part to that, is early onset Parkinson's disease more likely to have a familial link? So uh, let me answer the second one first, yes. So young onset Parkinson's disease um, is a little bit more likely to have a genetic or familial um, link is the good word. Um, we found that people who have young onset Parkinson's disease are more likely to have family members who also had Parkinson's disease. And we found that people who have young onset Parkinson's disease are more likely to have one of the genes that's been identified as a predisposition to Parkinson's. I wanna say predisposition because most of the genes that we found that um, you know cause Parkinson's are not 100% penetrated. So like they don't always cause Parkinson's. There are family members who will have the gene who never get Parkinson's. So they really just make it a little bit more likely that people will get it. Um, and the other question was, are the genes different? Uh, really no. Um, the genes that we have identified for Parkinson's uh, are pretty much the same ones that we, you know, the ones that predispose young onset are also pretty much the same ones that pre uh, predispose people to later onset. We found that for a lot of these genes, we, um, it, it's really a lifetime risk of developing Parkinson's. Um, so it's it's not like a different set of genes that we see in young onset Parkinson's disease. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Thank you for that information. Well, continuing on with, a, with another question. This is a, a little personal, but uh, from someone, one of our viewers. I seem to progress rapidly during my first seven years of having YOPD. Will it start progressing more slowly? And then a second part to that, it seems like there's, are, there are new treatments, drugs and therapies proposed every week. What is the most promising approach for slowing or stopping the disease's progression at this time? Okay, so progression of Parkinson's symptoms is very individualized. Um, also, there may be certain symptoms that progress and others that don't. There may be people who have certain symptoms, but not others, right? So not everyone has this looks the same when they have Parkinson's. Um, we do generally say that, you know, it's really hard for us to predict how quickly someone will progress. And we use a lot of benchmarks to try to understand how quickly will someone progress. And some of those are age, right? Age of onset, because we know people with younger onset progress more slowly for the most part. We also look at certain symptoms that, that indicate people might progress more slowly. Um, but one of the benchmarks we use is how quickly have they been progressing will also give us an idea of what we expect for the future. Um, you know, And again, like I said, it really is dependent on what treatments you've had and, and um, because if you, you know, depending on what you're able to tolerate, what medications, that also affects how the symptoms are doing. So it's, it's hard to answer in a very straight way that question, but for the most part, we do use certain kind of benchmarks to understand how quickly we expect someone to progress. Um, in terms of slowing down the progression, I had mentioned, um, you know, the only thing that so far has been proven to slow down progression in Parkinson's, uh, or at least the progression of symptoms is exercise. And that for me is probably the most important part of treating Parkinson's disease is to make sure that my patients are exercising and are really are able to, right? So a lot of the medications that I recommend are aimed at, yes, making you feel better, but really aimed at making sure that you can exercise, that you are exercising, you're not limited because of your uh, you know, mobility challenges with Parkinson's. Uh, there are a lot of drugs that are being tested right now. We're very in a very exciting time in Parkinson's research. Um, there are many theories as to why progression happens and how it happens. Some of it has to do with neuroinflammation. We think that there's um, an inflammatory, a chronic inflammatory process going on in the brain. So some of the, 
the therapies that are being developed now have are aimed at reducing inflammation in the brain. Um, there's also theories about alpha-synuclein, which alpha-synuclein is the abnormal protein that accumulates in the brain that produces, uh, well, we think it produces symptoms of Parkinson's. Um, so there's therapies that are aimed, that are, you know, making antibodies uh, against alpha-synuclein or even vaccines against alpha-synuclein that are, have been tested or being tested. Um, so there's lots of exciting uh, things happening there, but nothing that's really been proven yet. We're, we're, we're still several steps away from, from having that available. Yeah, I can say that definitely exercise has been tremendous for me. It really has made a difference and it's in a sense, it's just as good as the medications. I do need my medications, but definitely without exercise, I would not be where I'm at today. So thank yes, you. Yes, and I'm that. more likely to chastise people for not exercising than I am for not taking their medication. Yeah, you do ask me that whenever we're, um, we have our appointment together. So thank you. <laughs> um, how about another question? Is drastic weight loss common? Uh, drastic rapid weight loss is not so common. Weight loss is common. Um, and I mentioned that earlier, we, we do have to pay close attention to people staying in a normal BMI range because with Parkinson's, we do tend to see people losing weight. Um, some of it is related to the medications that can make people not so hungry. Some of it is, or even nauseated. Um, some of it's related to loss of sense of smell that often accompanies Parkinson's disease. It makes food a little bit less palatable, less exciting. Um, there's also um, some of the symptoms or, well, really the side effects of the carbidopa levodopa, the dyskinesias, we think also uh, cause people to lose weight because they're always moving. So they need higher calorie intake. And when you have Parkinson's and you're probably not feeling so good from your meds or you're the food doesn't taste so good or you're slow at eating. So you don't really want to sit at the table for as long. It, it's harder to get all those calories in. So yeah, I mean, rapid weight loss, we, we take a second look at and, and try to think outside the box of Parkinson's, but kind of chronic uh, weight loss and being underweight, we do see quite a bit in Parkinson's. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. How about another one? Should a person with PD drink alcohol? Uh, my official answer is, for the most part, of course, we worry about interactions between alcohol and medications. Uh, we also worry that alcohol can make people lose balance. It can make them a little bit lightheaded. It can lower blood pressure. And those are things that people with Parkinson's already are dealing with. So why would you want to make it worse? I think it's cruel to take away um, all the pleasures in life. So if somebody who is not having a lot of balance problems, uh, you know, is not taking medication that directly inter uh, interacts with alcohol, wants to have a half a glass of wine before they go to sleep at night, aren't planning on driving anywhere or walking anywhere, you know, um, it's, it's probably okay. But of course, you know, discuss it with your doctor because each case is a little bit different. But that just having Parkinson's is not a contraindication to having one glass of wine or, or half a glass of wine. Yeah, I've actually started a diet and part of my diet is the mind diet and it is a glass of red wine on a daily basis. So it ha I'm, I'm I've happy to talk wine. to you about that at our next appointment. If you like. Sounds good. <laughs> okay, moving on. Will I always be treated as someone with YOPD? How that long is are- excellent are question. How long are you in the YOPD group versus the general PD population when it comes to treatment and care? Great question. That is a great question. And um, I was hoping somebody would ask that. So it's for, so because I mentioned earlier in my talk that people who have young onset Parkinson's have a much longer disease duration and a much slower rate of progression. And that is not just before they turn 50, that goes on for the rest of their journey with Parkinson's. So in those ways, and because of the things that come from that, right, we are always going to treat people with young onset Parkinson's a little bit different than we treat our later onset. Um, so people who have young onset, we know they've had a longer disease duration by the time they reach 60 or 65. 
Um, so we know that they are already going to be more prone to things like motor fluctuations and dyskinesias, if, even if they don't have them yet. Um, so we do always treat them. And we also know that they progress more slowly. So we are always going to be treating you a little bit different than we do everybody else who has Parkinson's in that way. There are certain things that start to equal out. For example, um, you know, I mentioned there are other medications that we use in Parkinson's disease, like the dopamine agonist medications and amantadine. And those ones we shy away from a little bit as people get older because we do are more likely to see some of the negative side effects. So if someone with young onset Parkinson's disease reaches the, you know, when they reach the age of 65, for example, that would be a time when I would start to talk to them about maybe weaning them off of the amantadine or the um, dopamine agonists, because I know that as they get older, they are more likely to be experiencing some of those side effects. So in that way, I start treating a little bit more like I do some of my uh, other non young onset Parkinson's patients. Um, but in many ways, we are still it is still its own separate category of Parkinson's disease forever. Great. Those, those questions were tremendous. Thank you for entertaining uh, those questions for us, Dr. Sklerov, for your presentation. It has been a real pleasure to have you on and to share with us. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure for, for being invited. So thank you so much, all of you. Great. Well, um, we're going to take a 10 minute stretch and restroom break. So please feel free to turn off your cameras during this time. And we will see you back at 11.05 for our panel discussion.
Hello and welcome back everyone. Thanks for all the questions that you uh, submitted. Uh, I wanted to say just a quick word about that, that we will have some other times uh, available for question and answer during our symposium today. And then as well, if, you, if still your question has not been answered, that uh, we They are, you're muted right now. Huh. There you go. Sorry about that. Welcome back everyone. Uh, to kick off our panel discussion, I want to, I, I will be introducing, introducing Jessica Shore very, in just a moment. But I wanted to say quickly that many of you sent in questions that were not answered. So hang with us, hopefully, some of those questions will be answered. We will have another time for question and answer at the end of the program. And then as well, I'll share some final thoughts and also a telephone number that you can call and speak with someone to ask the question to as well. So hang in there with us on that. And so I would like to transition now to our panel discussion and Jessica Shore, who is the clinical social worker and Center Coordinator of Movement Disorders Center at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So Jessica, looking forward to hearing from you. Take it away. Thanks, JR. And hey, everybody out there. It's so nice to be with you today. So as JR said, I'm just gonna time myself because I know that we wanna be mindful of time. So as JR said, I'm Jessica Shore. I work at UNC Movement Disorders Center, UNC Chapel Hill which is a Parkinson's Foundation Center of Excellence. And I have been here for almost nine years and I continue to learn from all of you, the real experts living with Parkinson's every day. So how this panel is gonna work is myself and my two colleagues at Duke are each gonna share a little bit about a topic. And then after one of us shares, we're gonna open it up for panel discussion with three people living with YOPD. Um, and then the next person will present and then we'll open it up. And then at the end, we'll have an open Q&A like we did with Dr. Sleroff. And we also just wanna acknowledge that each of the things that we're talking about, for example, I'm talking about discussing the diagnosis are loaded topics. Um, so it's really the tip of the iceberg with all this, but hopefully it'll, you know, we'll still touch on a lot and it'll be helpful and relatable for you. So I wanted to talk about sharing about Parkinson's and having conversations about it. And um, I think Dr. Sleroff touched on this, but I just want to acknowledge that there can be stigma attached to living with Parkinson's. Uh, I won't get on my soapbox, but we live in a very ageist and ableist society. And I think that that shows up a lot with how people cope with Parkinson's and um, get reactions about living with Parkinson's. And this is especially the case for, we see for YOPD folks because it's often thought of as a disease for older people. And so if you're in your thirties or forties or early fifties living with it, it's, it can be an extra shock and extra stigma attached. And so that can make it a little bit more complicated sometimes with talking about the diagnosis. Um, and this goes for disclosing the diagnosis to people or just sort of generally conversing about it. Uh, sometimes it's a challenge because it implies that you yourself have to understand it first. And especially if you are newer to the diagnosis and you're still learning about it, and people are, you know, might have questions or how you're thinking about how to share it with people. It's, you know, that's something to be mindful of is how you wanna share it, what you know about it. Um, and also every time you talk about it, people will tell me that it's kind of like a, re a reality check of it, of, uh, which can be, I think, both an empowering thing and kind of a, a scary thing at the same time. Um, a huge thing that we hear about is a fear of burdening people or having people worry about you. And I there's so much that I can talk about with that. And I just want to validate that for you. I think no one ever wants to burden somebody else, especially people who we care about. Um, but usually people more often than not want to be a part of that journey with you and know how to support you in it. 
I also want to recognize that, and we don't, we're not even really getting into this so much today, but how you disclose it at work, if you're still working, is so variable on what kind of job you have and the support of your supervisors and how your symptoms might show up at work. And so that's definitely something that a lot of YOPD folks have to navigate to how to talk about it or not talk about it in their work environment. So I just wanna let y'all know and remind, or really just a reminder that who you choose to share your diagnosis with and when you do that and how you do that is very individual. And a lot of it has to do with your comfort with sharing about it. And that can happen in your own time. You know, some people we see share about it you know, everyone and everything about it immediately. And some people need a few years to, you know, feel settled into it before talking about it. That can depend on a lot of factors, like your own communication style you typically have on relationship dynamics. Um, but a huge thing that I want to emphasize with this is that that who you share it with, how and when, that is something that is in your control. In a, in a world where so much is out of our control, that is something that you get to choose. And there's no right or wrong way to talk about it, um, but it lets you decide what kind of information people have about you. And a lot of people will tell me they come up, and this is my word that I'm putting on it, with their spiel uh, when they tell people about it, of you know having this sort of prepared thing, not formally prepared thing, but I wanna let you know that I have Parkinson's disease and this is what it means for me, but I'm actually doing really well in these areas and um, here's some information if you wanna learn more, whatever that spiel looks like for you. And I don't think that this is only related to the first time you share di your diagnosis with someone, but also just in terms of keeping an open dialogue about Parkinson's over time. People with YOPD and also any age of PD can often share with us that this is a really empowering process. It's a way to take ownership of it for yourself. It's a way to normalize it for yourself. Um, but I think, I mean, more, even more importantly, it's a way to gather support. It's a way to connect with people on a real level to remind yourself that you don't have to go through this journey alone. Um, so even if you've been living with Parkinson's for a number of years and you're no longer really new to the diagnosis, I hope that this still can imply, apply to you because you've been figuring out how, how to talk about it and how to incorporate it into your life for a number of years. Um, and you can probably even think back to how that's gone and learn from it and maybe even think of what advice you would give others who are newer to the diagnosis. A big challenge that I hear from folks is when talking about the diagnosis is anticipating and navigating different reactions that people have. Uh, there's, there's the expert of, oh, you have Parkinson's? I read this article about Parkinson's and have you tried so-and-so medication or this experimental trial or are you sure that it's it's Parkinson's because to me, it looks like this other thing when, you know, they're not a doctor. You had a doctor diagnose your Parkinson's and sometimes navigating the expert can be kind of tough. We also see a lot of people who have to figure out how to respond to the fixers. I think human nature is to want to fix things. And when something can't be fixed and you just want to sort of tell someone to let them know what's going on and sort of sit with that and just have their support. It's not always super helpful when they're trying to fix it for you. But I think the biggest reaction people fear is what they share with us is pity. No one wants to be pitied. Um, that, that sort of implies not enough hope, not enough positivity, when maybe that's what you're needing right now. And there's definitely a difference between sympathy. I think it's a lot harder for us when people react with sympathy, like, oh, that's so sad. I'm so sorry for you. That might not be what you're needing. A lot of times what we're needing is empathy of people meeting you where you are and validating that experience and saying, let me walk this alongside you and let me know how I can do that. 
And so you can probably think back to experiences of talking about Parkinson's with people, whether you've been diagnosed for you know, a couple months or 25 years, um, and think to what worked, what didn't work, what did you learn from that about Parkinson's, about yourself, about others, about the world? I think that there's definitely an opportunity for learning through that process. But something I really want to highlight for y'all too is the importance of being gentle with yourself. That's easier said than done, I know. But I hear that from people with Parkinson's all the time that they're constantly practicing or needing to be intentional about giving themselves grace, showing themselves patience, talking to themselves like they would talk to somebody who they love. And I think part of that is giving yourself permission to feel all your feelings, sad, anxious, existential, hopeful, grateful, all of it. Um, giving yourself permission to figure out what accepting Parkinson's means for you in your life. To give yourself permission to say that you don't have all the answers or that you want to talk about Parkinson's more, that you don't want to talk about Parkinson's as much as you are, giving yourself permission to feel vulnerable, to feel brave, to recognize your own strengths and resilience that you're bringing to this, and also to advocate for yourself. Only you know what your personal goals are and your boundaries and your needs. Um, and you wanna make sure that your voice keeps being heard and is a part of the conversation, no matter how long you're living with Parkinson's for. I just wanna read, and I know I'm kind of at time, but this, this quote, well, it's not really a quote, it's actually something called the Manifesto of the Brave and Broken Hearted that I love because I was thinking about uh, what I was talking about today and it really applied. It's from Brene Brown, who is a PhD social worker um, who, out of Texas and she does a lot of work around shame and resilience and vulnerability and reframing vulnerability. So she wrote this thing called the Manifesto of the Brave and Broken Hearted and I'll just read it to you uh, where it says, there is no greater threat to the critics and cynics and fear mongers than those of us who are willing to fail because we have learned, sorry, willing to fall. I don't have my glasses on who are willing to fall because we have learned how to rise. With skinned knees and, bro and bruised hearts, we choose owning our stories of struggle over hiding, over hustling, over pretending. When we deny our stories, they define us. When we run from struggle, we are never free. So we turn toward the truth and we look it in the eye. We will not be characters in our own stories not villains, not victims, not even heroes. We are the authors of our lives. We write our own daring endings. We, cr <clears throat> we craft love from heartbreak, compassion from shame, grace from disappointment, courage from failure, showing up is our power, story is our way home, truth is our song. We are the brave and broken hearted, we are rising strong. And that really resonated with me as I was thinking about this topic for today. So if you take anything away from this, it's that everyone with Parkinson's is different, but that means that this is your own story with Parkinson's. So you get to choose who you bring into that story and how you get to tell that story and how you make meaning out of that story and journey. So thank you. And so with that, I want to bring on my panelists with YOPD. And I'll wait a second while that gets set up. Waiting for Craig, there we go. So I'm gonna, before we, I ask my question to y'all to hear your story a little bit, I just wanna do, being mindful of our time, very brief introductions so we know who you are and um, Alicia, can you introduce yourself first? Yes. Hello and welcome everybody. Um, my name is Alicia Peters. 
Um, I was diagnosed two and a half years ago in 2018 at the age of 45. And I think many of us with young onset, we notice symptoms far before that date. Um, I know for a year, um, I struggled and, and would ignore symptoms. And, and I think sometimes we think if we say them out loud, um, they become reality. So it was, it was, there was definitely a fear around it for about a year. Um, so 2018 is, is that date for me. Um, I am from Minnesota, so it is going to be 38 degrees here today. So I'll make sure I take out my lighter winter coat today. So it's going to be a heat wave in Minnesota. Um, and I teach at a local college. I teach um, future educators there. Um, art education is my focus. I'm married um, for, gosh, I think I 25 years, 28 years. I'll have to check that out later. And then I have a 17-year-old um, daughter also that I am raising and caring for a senior in high school right now. So life is challenging with that too. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thanks, Alicia. Um, Greg, can you introduce yourself? How are you guys doing? My name is Gregory Monroe from Durham, North Carolina. I was diagnosed in 2012, I believe. And um, um, like Alyssa, I uh, had a uh, part, well, I had, I had symptoms probably around 2001, but being, you know, scared, not knowing what it was, uh, not really wanting to hear what it was. I uh, they delayed also getting diagnosed, clinically diagnosed. Uh, right now, I'm currently in Durham, Carolina. Um, I've joined Rocksteady Boxing and for about two, two years now. Uh, I am so also a product of the DBS simulation, deep brain stimulation for surgery. Um, that is being on, that is a life changer for me. It has been, I just celebrated my first year, February 4th of this year with my first year since last year. Um, it's been a roller coaster ride for real, um, but it's been worth every bit of it. Awesome, thank you so much, Greg. And last but certainly not least is Dave. Dave, who are you? Oh, hi, Jessica. I ask that question all the time. Who am I? I'm a research scientist, just recently retired in December of this past year. And um, I had Parkinson's disease for 16 years. I was diagnosed in, nine, in 2005. And um, I have three children, two are out of college and one is in college at NC State. And uh, I'm a firm believer in all this uh, act, strenuous activities. I, uh, I do a lot of uh, exercises, I, four to five times a week. I do boxing, um, bike riding, bowling, ping pong, you name it, I do it all. Uh, and it really is helpful. That's really gotten me through all this. And um, Dr. Sklerov's uh, talk was right on the money for me. It, it hit all the gaps that I had had in my thinking about the disease. And it was an excellent presentation. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, all three of you. So I related to my topic, but also this could mean whatever it means for you. I'm thinking about your Parkinson's journey question that I wanted to share with you is, can you all think of a circumstance when you shared about your diagnosis with someone that either went really well or maybe didn't go so well? And what, what did you learn from that experience um, that you can share as advice for other people with YOPD when they talk to people about the diagnosis? And whoever wants to answer that first, or I could call on one of you, but. Uh, I'll go first. Thanks, Dave. This is, I have two stories and one's pretty funny. I'll tell them really quick. I was golfing with a guy who was 75 years old. My son and I were matched up with him and another fellow. And he was 75 and he was so happy he could hit from the women's tees. And he would hit the ball and it would go straight and it would go, he, he was shooting like pars and bogeys all the time, which are a good score. And I was all over the place. I was hitting the ball to the left to the right and uh, nowhere near the hole. And I thought, should I tell this guy that I have Parkinson's disease? You know, I, 
uh, and there's got to be a reason I'm not hitting the ball very well. And I finally got, I got to the point where I was going to tell him that I had Parkinson's disease. And he says, so have I, I've had it for 12 years. So it just goes to show. Dave, what did you learn from that experience? I learned that uh, it's not that important to, to name, name yourself by a disease and that there was, there was hope that I'd still be golfing like this 75 year old man. And I'm 61 now, so I'm catching up. Thank you, Dave, that was great. Um, Alicia or Greg, do you have thoughts on that? Um, I've, been, I've been really public about um, the disease. I, about a few months after my um, diagnosis, I shared um, publicly with um, you know everybody in my life that was close to me. Um, I saw it as what um, the doctor was sharing also that it was something that I was going to have in my life for a long time. And I felt, how can I um, make a difference with this for future um, generations, for um, the people around me that I care and love and, and for myself, how can I help with that? Um, and, and one thing I found with sharing it is that people really wanna help um, and that's in, you know, for Minnesota, we got the Minnesota nice thing going up here. So everybody wants to help and everybody has a thought on something and, um, and, and people just want to help. And that was something that um, I realized with my sharing, because I would get frustrated, uh, what you were sharing, Jessica, about people sharing me their, um, their idea of what could help me. Um, you try this oil? Have you tried this food? Have you tried this? You know, and I would get really frustrated with that. And, and once I shifted my mind and everybody just wants to help, that helped me with that conversation. And I had, and you talked about having this kind of statement. I came up with my statement and I would say, this is where I'm at with my disease. This is where I am working hard at right now in my life and where I'm at. And I would thank them and I'd say, you know how you can really help me? Donate to my moving day team and you know, donate or join my team. Join, um, donate to the Parkinson's Foundation. I just tell you, that's how you can really help me um, because I do use the Parkinson's Foundation weekly, daily um, in my life. So I, that was my blanket statement and it, it seemed to help and my moving day team as well. So maybe it's doing well with that too. <laughs> I love that, Alicia. The idea of reframing it is no matter how they're reacting, it's that people are wanting to be there for you and help you. And also, and I didn't even talk about this, so I'm so glad that you did, of thinking about ways that people can help you. And that way you can share that with them as a way to advocate for yourself and something tangible that they can do to support you. That's great. Thank you. Greg, what about you? Um, well, my first person I told was two people, my mom and one of my best friends. I have five best friends. Well, I'm sorry, four, three best friends. Um, I told my one best friend I've been on him since I was third grade and told my mom, my mom told my dad, my dad told my brother. Um, all of them had the same reaction, really? Okay, well, uh, you know, what do you want to do about it? Um, unfortunately, at the time when I was diagnosed, I was in Florida. So I didn't really have a support system as I have now, that kind of hindered me for about a year and a half. I went, uh, had a little bit of depression going on. But then when I went, my last appointment with my doctor, he actually asked me um, how to feel about depression. I was like, well, I, I, you know, I don't want to kill myself, of course, but I'm feeling a little down and everything. And that's when I was uh, given the carpet open. Um, unfortunately, I had to leave Florida, came home, and yeah. I was really quiet, actually. Um, I was in that, that realm of didn't want nobody to see me, you know, me being this young, they look at me like, what's going on with him? Not knowing what was going on. Um, I had to do research myself on what was going on so I can tell people. But the fact that my determination, because I always worked two jobs, I'm a chef and I work at auto parts in the morning. So the fact that I was still working, the fact that I had a still smile on my face, kind of help people to look at me and say, well, I can't be, have pity on him because he's my, well, if he's laughing, if he's smiling, then I can't be like, oh, you know, I'm like, no, no, don't, don't, don't do that for me. Treat me like a regular person. Um, I would always tell people, you know, say, how you doing? Well, I'm a little shaky, I'm doing okay. Um, so my thing was to not make humor of the situation, but make humor of me. Um, it's like not telling jokes, like anything like that, but just on the level of, uh, being open-minded and being able to take 
someone saying, I can help, or I would like to help. But knowing, unfortunately, myself, until I got to Rock City, didn't know where I could turn to for that help. So my personal journey was kind of dark a little bit for a while. But then, like I said, once I joined Box Daddy, joined the boxing, and I opened up and started talking about it and got the DBS, and it worked. Um, everything now is just bows and, and daisies. So I would tell people, my, my one thing, I, if you don't think anything, is just, just tell somebody, at least tell one person. Yeah, at least one person so that you're not, you're not alone in exactly. it. And I also, I really liked what you shared too about like how you choose to share it with people. People are going to react based on that. So, you know, if, if people are like, so I have Parkinson's and it's the worst thing in the whole world. And, you know, this is not what I, I mean, people are going to react one way compared to like what you and Alicia and also Dave talking about, about here I am, I, this is part of me, but it doesn't define me. And I'm doing really well in these areas and just treat me like you normally would. It doesn't change me or our relationship. And took some time to get there, but yeah, that's the best way to do it. Yeah. And I think that's a great point too, Greg, of it's, you know, that it, everyone again can do that in their own time and that's okay. It's not, you know, you can decide when you're comfortable and when you're in the mental head space too. My dog is walking in front of me. So I'm sorry if anyone's hearing that. Um, all great stories and advice from all three of you. Thank you so much. And I'm seeing a lot of great questions that I'd love for you all to address when we get to the Q and A portion of this about how you tell work and what are helpful resources for you. So we're going to save those for the Q&A so that I can at this point turn it over to my colleague Ann Kosom, who is my one of my two counterparts at the Duke Movement Disorder Center. And she's going to talk about caring for yourself while caring for others and relationships. Thanks, Ann. Hey. Thank you, Jess. Um, so I came to our Movement Disorders Clinic after spending 20 years at Duke in the world of oncology, working with both adults and children who have cancer. A lot of what I did in that role was help families to adjust and cope and share the information with children about either the child's diagnosis or the parents. Um, and I feel like much of what I learned there is transferable to Parkinson's disease. So I'm looking forward to sharing some of the things I've learned with you today. Similarly, what we're gonna talk about is transferable to dealing with any child in your life, um, whether it's your own child, your stepchild, um, nieces, nephews, grandkids, family, friends, doesn't matter. Kids are kids. Um, so hopefully all these principles and thoughts will will work for um, how you think about things. You know, so when we think of to tell or not to tell, really that's a little bit of a, uh, probably not the best statement to use because the reality is, the real question is, is when do you tell? Because it's not something that you could keep secret forever. And there's a lot of things that go into that. Um, most of all, you need to know, there is no right or wrong way to handle this. It's different for everybody. Um, there's a lot of different considerations um, that go into it. Um, what are the age of your children? I mean, are they toddler, infants, toddlers um, that they just don't even really know anything that's going on or are they older elementary, middle school, high school? Um, because if that's the case, it's a little bit of a different scenario. Um, how about your symptoms? What's going on? Um, is, is there noticeable symptoms? at this point, or are things mostly non-motor that they may not notice? Answers to those questions are gonna impact when you tell the children in your life. The other thing that has a profound impact is your readiness, because sometimes many of you may be newly diagnosed, and sometimes you just need to get your head around it for yourself and have time to process and sort things out, um, and that's okay. Again, there's no right or wrong. Um, we're gonna, I'm just gonna talk about a few other principles and considerations and things about kids. And basically you can take that, put it with what you know about yourself and your situation and what you know about your children. Because the reality is, is you're the expert on your ch 
child, your children, and your family. So you're going to make the best decision, decision on how and when to do this. But here's some things to talk about. Um, you know, why are people reluctant to tell kids? Mostly they just don't want to worry them. They don't want to worry them, cause anxiety or burden them, um, or they're afraid that, that they're not going to have the answers and the children are going to ask, ask them questions they're they don't know what to say. Um, that's all really, really normal. Um, let's start with thinking about what do we know about kids? Um, kids in general are very perceptive. They have this amazing spidey sense and ability to sense any sort of shift of force um, in a room. They can feel your worry. They can feel sadness. They can feel fear, anger. Um, they also see symptoms. They notice something's a little bit different, that people are acting differently. They hear whispers. They notice tension um, between parents. The challenge with that and the problem for kids is that then they can internalize those things. So they might think that you're angry or frustrated with them or that the tension that's happening or whispering that's happening is because of them and something they did. So, and, and that's often not at all the case. Um, the spoiler alert, uh, kids generally think the world revolves around them. They think everything is about them. And they also have something going on called magical thinking, where they believe that thing, whatever they do, that things they do or think make things happen. And we're going to circle back to that. But that's something significant to know and to think about and have in the back of your head. So if you think about kids and they're sensing all this weirdness and they don't know what's really going on, just feeling weirdness, then they're just kind of left to their imagination to, to, to sort it out. And what we do know about kids, too, is that they have really active imaginations. Um, and when it comes to things like this, they always imagine things as much worse than they are. Um, they can, they figure that if it's too scary for their parents to even talk about, this must be really bad. And so um, they can imagine that my parents are getting divorced. They can imagine somebody's dying. They could think something's wrong with them. Um, and again, that's not the case, um, but, but they don't know what else to do with that. And they, that can leave them feeling scared. They can be confused. They can feel left out. Um, and they can just be alone with their worries and concerns, which is, you know, often the same thing that people are trying to avoid by, by not telling them. So um, what do we do with that? Um, you know, we, we can't keep this a secret forever. And it can be emotionally exhausting to keep up a secret. Um, and that robs you um, of your en precious energy, your time, um, your emotional energy, and also it robs you of time and closeness with your kids, where you guys could all be on the same page and working together as a family. The other thing to consider um, that, that's important is if they hear it from someone else or hear it in a different way than what you intended, um, it can cause, it can destroy their trust. And then they don't know in the future if they can believe what you tell them. Um, kids are so curious, we know that, and they can be really sneaky about when they wanna know something. Um, it is not unusual for them to be eavesdropping on conversations. When you are on a phone call and you think you're alone, do not be the least bit surprised if there are little ears hanging around. Um, kids are known to pretend they're sleeping so that they can hear what mom and dad are talking about. So they will go to great lengths to figure it out. So sometimes it's best to take control of that and tell them in a way that you, you want to. The overall solution to some of these things is to learn to share your diagnosis in a way that they can understand. If you include them in a family discussion and then you give them information um, that's factual and true, then they're able to have and share their feelings and worries. They can figure out for themselves what's going on and then they can share that with you. And this gives them a sense of security to know that it's safe and that they it can also bring you closer to them and closer as a family unit. 
what you tell them is going to vary. It's going to vary by their age, their developmental level. Um, those are going to be different factors. But it's important to know that what you say is not nearly as important um, as conveying that you're there for them and that they can bring any question or concern to you um, that they have. Don't expect that they're going to want a lot of information at once. They won't. They're just going to want little bits and pieces go off, do their thing, process, and then they'll come back and ask questions along the way. And that's good. And it's okay if you don't have an answer. You'll have time to get the answer and get the answers together. When you think about these conversations, um, what is it that kids most need to understand and take away from any conversation you have about a diagnosis? The most important thing, number one thing, is there there's nothing that they or you did or didn't do to cause Parkinson's. Um, this is where the magical thinking comes in because they can think that they did something to cause it or that you did something to cause it. And that is just not the case um, with this, with Parkinson's. Um, they also need to know that it's not contagious. This, this is huge right now with this COVID world, with everybody so concerned about catching COVID and um, things like that, that this is a, they need to understand this is a different kind of illness. They can't get it from you. That means they can hug you, they can touch you. If you share food, they're not going to catch it. That's just not how Parkinson's work works. They also need to know how it's going to affect them. Um, I, I think the underlying premise here um, to sort of help them know is you're not dying. Um, this is what we heard Dr. Sklarov said, people live with Parkinson's for a long time. Therefore, it's important to have a hopeful tone um, when you're talking to them, that this is something we're going to live with and we're going to do this together. Um, you are let them know that you're going to your doctor, that you have a specialist who understands Parkinson's and you're going regularly and together with your doctor, you have a plan. Um, they need to, as I said, understand that your family is going to work together to cope with this, um, with the PD um, diagnosis and treatment, and think of ways that they can help, um, that they can go for walks with you, they can exercise with you, maybe you need them to carry a plate for you somewhere, or whatever. Think of ways that they can be involved and they can be a part of things. Kids like to be help, help and take pride in helping their parents. Mostly, they just need to know that they're loved and they're going to be taken care of. If you take away nothing else from my conversation, the most important thing that you can do for your children is make yourself a priority. Um, we all know the example of the flight attendant on the airplane and what they always say, that when those oxygen masks drop, you need to put your own on first, and then you can turn around and take care of the person beside you. And this is no different. The better you manage your symptoms and stress level and do the things that you know that you need to do to function at your best, the better you will be for the people in your life. It's important not to have any guilt about that. I think as parents and people who are caretakers of the people around us, and you know, we tend to feel guilty. We feel like that's selfish if we're taking time for ourselves but nothing could be further from the truth. It's the exact opposite. When you're caring for yourself, it is the very best thing um, that you could be doing for your children and your family, because that's gonna help you to function at your best and be the best parent um, or adult figure in their life. As um, we already talked about earlier, one of the unique aspects of the YOPD population is the multiple stressors going on. You got family going on, work, most are caring for other people in your life, whether it's aging parents or grandparents or siblings. Um, you're doing all this while you're learning about and managing um, Parkinson's disease, and that's really stressful. So I would encourage you to think about what are the things that help you. We've already heard today that things that every Every person with Parkinson's can help, we know it can help, is your exercise and doing that consistently. The sleep that you get, reducing the stress in your life. But are there other things that help you specifically? What are those things? You know you. Is it support groups? Is it 
time with friends? Is it time alone? Is it having a counselor um, in your life to help manage your mental health or to learn some new coping skills? Whatever it is, do those things and make them a priority. I'd also encourage you to really focus on taking care of your care partner, um, whoever that is in your life. If it's a spouse, if it's a significant other, if it's a family member, um, keep in mind, this is really stressful for them too. And it's new and they're learning. Um, and it's, you're in this experience together, but you can have different experiences with it. So it's important to consider their feelings and um, the experience they're having and give each other room, give each other room to sort of cope differently and make your way through. Um, remember that you need to be a team, that you can be on the same page about things, that you can give each other time away from the kids in your life so you can take care of yourself and do the things you need to do. You might want to consider um, some temporary marital counseling as you will learn to adjust to your diagnosis, maybe some of the symptoms you're having, um, relationship or sexual intimacy concerns that might be happening. Um, you know, these kinds of things will all ebb and flow um, through this. And so having an objective party in your life who you can kind of tap in at different points when you might be having new and different challenges can be really helpful to establish that kind of a relationship. The other thing I will say that I think is crucial for any um, relationship is that you have time, just you and your partner, um, that no kids are around and that you make a pact. We're not gonna talk about the kids or the Parkinson's disease, that we're gonna have a regular date night or date afternoon or whatever that means. It, it might be a little different now in the age of COVID and what that looks like, but the point is, is that you're getting a setting side of time um, where you're getting some time alone without the kids that you're not talking about the kids or your Parkinson's. Um, I know that's a lot to digest. This could be something that we is its own topic, but I just wanted to hit some of the main main points um, for folks. This is a really new area for that you're needing to navigate. There's a huge learning curve and. Um, just want you to know that you're not alone. You can reach out to your clinical social worker at your movement disorder clinic. Um, you know, sometimes just having somebody else to process some of this, to, to brainstorm with, to think about how to do things, to practice talking to your kids. You know, that's part of what we're here for is to sort of help you with those kinds of things. The other thing that, as you can tell, even from this day to day is really helpful is hearing from other people who've been there, who've already navigated this, learn some of the things that worked or didn't work from them. And whether that's through a support group or just developing some relationships with other people um, who are going through the same thing. And with that, I'm gonna ask our panelists to come back. Okay. I'm not seeing. There, how's that? Okay, good. Oh, that was very good. Okay. A lot of information. Thanks, yeah, I packed it yeah. in. Um, well, thank you guys so much for coming back. Uh, I would love to sort of shift the focus to you and put a question out there. Um, I, I gotta tell you a couple things. Uh, my kids are all in their 20s now and it's, it's I was worried about telling them when they were in their teens and in their, in their single digits, but uh, it's, it's 20 years down the road. And now I'm saying I didn't, it's, it's, it didn't seem to be important when I tell them, as long as I'm open with conversations and tell them that I'm going to be okay. And not, not knowing whether I was going to be okay. You know, I'm not, I'm not that much worse than I was, you know, five or 10 years ago, I'm pretty much slow progressive. But I did have one story about my daughter when she was 14, just two years after I was diagnosed. I um, talk, took her to her favorite restaurant, Remington, Remington Grill. They have good French fries there. So we went there for the French fries and I was gonna tell her that uh, I have Parkinson's disease. And I told her, we both started just to swell up with tears. And she turned around and she looked at me and she said, is it genetic? 
And I said, oh yeah, I, we don't know if it is or not, but that was her biggest fear. I said, she was catch it. So what a smart kid she was. Yeah, I mean, I think that's great. I mean, knowing your kids to know what's going to work. Does it make the most sense to talk to them together? Do, just doing a one-on-one -on -one thing can be really good because it gives them time to sort of ask what they want to ask and what's important to them in that moment. Yeah. Um, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Do either Alicia or Greg, do you have um, a, something you want to share about maybe talking to the children in your life? Or... Another, you have a choice. You can answer that or um, have, is there a way, how have maybe sharing how you have been able to intentionally care for yourself with PD while you're caring for the other people in your life, whoever those people are. I, I'm part of the sandwich age, they call us, right? <laughs> we're, mm -hmm. we're caring for our parents yeah. also and we're caring for children. Um, so we're right in the middle there where we um, have lots of caring to do other than ourselves and, and, you know, with a job I love also uh, that I put a lot of care into it's, it's carving out that time needs to be really intentional. Um, my daughter was 15 at the time when I told her and humor has been a really big part of our family. Um, you know, we, we use humor a lot. It helps lighten the situation and and um, after telling her, I joked that there's a great neuroscience program at the college I teach at. Mm -hmm. Consider neuroscience is a, is a joke, but um, she's brilliant. So I, um, whatever she chooses would be wonderful. Um, the intentional piece, um, my family feels really good when they see me taking care of myself. Mm -hmm. My my spouse has said to me, I can be here for you. I can provide great food for you. But what I can't do for you is I can't exercise for you. I can't do that. Um, so when they see me exercising, when they see me getting up early and working out with my group that I work out with every single morning, we via FaceTime every single morning with, with a great workout with um, three other amazing women in my life. And um, when they see me doing that, that helps them in a huge way because they know that I'm taking care of myself to support the slowing, the progression of it. And that's what I can do for myself, which also shows that I care for them. And it, it means a lot to them to see that kind of support. Yeah, yeah, it does. It's huge. I think it's very normal for parents in general, just to feel bad about their guilty. And I, I think making it a priority. And, and that's such a great example for our kids too, of mm -hmm. that it's important to take care of ourself. Um, that's great. Greg, how about you? Um, <laughs> well, never been married and don't have any kids, but I did have a dog. And she was, she was my best friend. She actually was the one that got me out to walk as well. You know, dogs got to walk, so she made me get up and do exercise every, every morning before I went to work. Um, and so it was a little bit different for me because, like I said, I told my mom, and my mom was my caretaker as of right now. Um, but because of the DBS and my profession, I'm looking into venturing in my own business. So um, it has slow me down, but not stop. And so like I said, me coming from not having a, you know, a significant other in my life or kids, it was, you know, it was, it was warming to know they had my back. So when, you know, when I told my best friend, I have three, um, actually, and the funny thing is I didn't tell the other two until I was coming home, which was like three years later. Um, because I just didn't want them to have pity on, me, you know. Um, but they did. They treated me. They treated me the exact same way. So, I think you know when you are telling your, your spouses or your children about your about your situation. I call it like some disease about your situation. That kind of make it not make it seem lighter than what it is. Let them know to treat me the same way. You know, maybe I may be a little slower than I was before. May shake a little bit, but it's still me inside. Nothing about that changes. Hey, Greg, I have a question in terms of taking care of yourself. What have you learned um, 
that's important for you like what's one what do you do to help take care of yourself um i try to do the same thing i used to do just just a lot slower um before i got my dbs it was it was a little hard to you know go to the bathroom wash yourself go on clothes um but just don't stop you know do 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 through due do, do diligence don't stop um that's the best thing i can tell someone because you know, I didn't, um, when I came here, I was kind of depressed. So it took me a while to get back into rhythm of things. So when I did that, it was, um, like I said, brush my teeth, not a problem. Um, I had to modify some things. Colin Michelle loved to cook. So me being in the kitchen was modified, which I hated that. <laughs> uh, and my mom hated because too, I couldn't cook for it. But um, just determination is my, my main drive to just keep doing what you normally do modify it to change it to where you can do it safely, whatever you're doing safely and positively, but still don't stop. You know? Greg, thank you. That is such important advice. It really is. Um, I think one of the biggest things that I have learned in, in my work with Parkinson's patients is the importance of continuing to do the things you love, that mm -hmm. at some point or other, it might require for you to adapt how you do it or do it a little bit differently, but it's not uncommon for folks to think, oh, because I can't do whatever it is exactly the way I've always done it, well, I'm just not gonna do that anymore. And so having the, the people who I see who do the best for the longest time are the people who can adapt and who can just say, okay, I might not be able to do it exactly the same way, but, I still am going to figure out how, and I'm going to tweak it or do it different and still be able to do the thing I love. So I appreciate you sharing that. That was really helpful. Thank you all. With that, I'm going to um, pass it off to my partner, my colleague over at Duke, who is also a clinical social worker and center of excellence coordinator, Allison Allen. Thanks, Anne. Okay. Um, I'm so glad to be here with y'all today. We have already heard such amazing um, nuggets of information and advice um, from our panelists and from our other speakers. And we've really focused a lot on sharing your diagnosis with those that are closest to you. Um, we call that your natural support system. So next we're going to talk about um, taking it a, a step further. The next step is really to formalize and be proactive in expanding your support network beyond those um, people that are closest to you, your immediate friends, or excuse me, your immediate family and close friends. So if you're looking for a great place to start, if you haven't already, um, I like to recommend um, creating an interdisciplinary care team. Interdisciplinary care is really a team approach to care. It's where a variety of specialists collaborate with you and your family to, um, to, to make a plan that's specific for you. For folks with young onset Parkinson's disease, this interdisciplinary care team would ideally start with a movement disorder specialist. We really do see the best outcomes for folks with Parkinson's disease when they're working with movement disorder specialists, as opposed to a primary care doctor only or a general neurologist only. But the movement disorder specialist is just one part of that team. And you can see this image up on your screen. This is one that um, I borrowed from one of our flyers from, a, from our interdisciplinary clinic. Um, so some of those team members might include a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, a speech, thing, speech language pathologist, a social worker, a pharmacist, a PA or a nurse practitioner. Um, and like I said, this is just an image that represents some of the specialists that we have at our clinic, but there are so many other folks that might be really integral part of, of your care team, you know, nutritionists, spiritual care. Um, and of course, we really want to um, encourage you to consider having an outpatient mental health professional as well. I know that this has been mentioned a few times. This could be a psychiatrist, a counselor, a therapist, or a clinical social worker like Ann and Jessica and I. Um, anybody that's available in your community. Um, they may not know a lot about YOPD specifically, but many providers have quite a bit of experience working with families and family dynamics and also chronic illness. So you will find that these folks will be really helpful in managing the non-motor symptoms that come along with your young onset PD. 
They can help, like I said, to navigate family dynamics, relationship issues you might have, helping you with those conversations that Anne, Anne and Jessica have talked about, and of course, for planning for the future. You might be thinking, hey, I'm new to YOPD or I'm, I'm young um, and I don't have time for all these visits or I don't need all these specialists yet. But really, research shows that early referrals to interdisciplinary care um, can be incredibly beneficial to folks with YOPD when it comes to both motor and non-motor symptoms. So what would you get um, from interdisciplinary care? Well, what you can expect is baseline assessments, especially if you're doing well. So baseline assessment about where you are now. This can really help clarify opportunities um, that are specific to you for um, opportunities for improvement. It can help to define where your strong suits are, what's really going well for you, what it is that you're doing that's been helpful to you already. But really most importantly, I think for folks with YOPD, I think what you would, what we would hope is that you would get tailored preventative strategies to, um, to, to staying well. Um, this might include you know, a prescribed exercise regimen or maybe voice and communication exercises, which a lot of folks with YOPD are really focused on as they um, uh, maybe continue in the workplace. Um, and, and, and this, of course, would be all based on your priorities. That's the point of interdisciplinary care um, is it's a collaborative approach, including your priorities. So the team will help you to bring this all together and make that personalized care plan. Maybe find a place to start if you can't fit all the appointments into your busy life. You can also consider scheduling multiple appointments on the same day and just knock it out. Um, and again, this is all based on your priorities. <clears throat> Another thing that I'd like to mention when I talk about interdisciplinary care is that younger brains have what we call in the neurology world more neuroplasticity. So neuroplasticity is this fancy word that really just means that your brain as a younger person has a greater ability to be retrained or to relearn things after an illness or an in injury. So this is another example of why early engagement in interdisciplinary care, early on in an illness and at a younger age is a perfect fit and a perfect fit for folks with YOPD. So if you're not sure how to get engaged with this, um, you might check the Parkinson's Foundation website to see if there's a Parkinson's Foundation Center of Excellence like UNC or Duke close by. Um, and there also are resources there to find even just PD trained interdisciplinary providers in your community. So there's a lot of resources and support that are available through the, through the movement disorders world, but there's a whole different world of support outside of the doctor's office. And that's what we're gonna talk about next. This might include support groups, educational programs, just like this one, and even exercise programs. And now all of these more than ever in this COVID world are incredibly accessible online, right? Um, there's live ones like this. There's also lots and lots of recorded ones that you can go back later and refer to over and over, which I like, um, and watch them on your own time, of course. So support groups, I'm gonna start there. These are a great way to connect um, with others. People, you can find people that have shared experiences um, with YOPD, but also beyond that, shared life experiences. In fact, there's one of the panelists uh, here today who I had a conversation with outside of this, who shared with me that it was really not until he walked into his first support group that he had ever seen anybody that looked like him. Um, and I recognize that for some of you today, um, you might be having that same feeling um, watching the other folks on the call today. In the world of Parkinson's, we often hear folks that tell us that they're wary of joining support groups, especially for folks with YOPD. They're um, afraid they won't fit in or, or what they might see, particularly with older, uh, particularly if the groups have more typical Parkinson's members. But really and truly, just know that there are so many different groups out there. Again, the Parkinson's Foundation website can help you with that. Um, and um, we are actually working on recreating a list of all the groups in the Carolinas as well, just right now. If you can't find the right one out there, consider starting one. Uh, it can be very informal. There's resources for that too on the Parkinson's Foundation website. 
And I just want to give a shout out to our local community as being a really great example of just that. There was a need that um, seemed to be unmet. And so in just a few weeks, we'll be starting, uh, actually in the first week of April, um, there'll be a new group in our community called Triangle Connections. And this is a group that's for folks with YOPD, but is specifically focused on folks with YOPD who um, are um, wanting to talk about their careers and parenting and relationships. Um, and I'm really excited about that. So I think that the uh, flyer with the information will be shared in the resources today. But if you have more questions or think that might be a group for you, definitely reach out to Ann and I for that. Um, so just really commend the folks in our community for um, starting something new um, there. Another uh, great uh, change, I guess, positive silver lining from the COVID world is the expansion of exercise programs that are now available online right now. So before there might've been a few DVDs here and there, but now there's this whole world of online exercise programs. In fact, the Parkinson's Foundation website through the PD Health at Home program releases a new exercise every Friday. There are so many exercise programs that are designed for folks with Parkinson's, um, but there's really no best one. Uh, I think Dr. Sklaroff talked about this earlier as well. It's about finding the one that you enjoy the most that fits into your schedule, importantly, and that's being safe. You know, a couple examples that come to mind are boxing, Pilates and dance. And uh, in our community, we have quite a large pickleball um, for Parkinson's. We have a golfing program um, and the list goes on and on. I also wanna mention arts programs. Um, there are singing groups at Duke alone. We have two different, uh, two different groups that are focused on voice and singing and music. Um, and there's also an improv group over in Chapel Hill. There are so many uh, programs that you can truly find one that's a fit for you. The sky is really the limit. Staying active together is just a great way to build relationships. So maybe it's not called a support group, but you definitely are building camaraderie with the folks that are boxing next to you, for example. So this is a great way to have shared experiences. Finally, I wanna just commend everybody for being here today on a Saturday morning, now Saturday afternoon. This is really, you know, keep that up. Keep, keep doing what you're doing. Soak up all the available information. Centers of Excellence like ours and UNC, we regularly are offering educational program. Like I said before, the Parkinson's Foundation program right now, the Parkinson's Foundation through the PD Health at Home program right now, basically has new programs every day. Um, and these are all free. I really want to point out to y'all, I know I'm mentioning a lot of resources, but if you haven't already watched it, you can go back and watch from the fall on the Parkinson's Foundation website. They had their first YOPD expert briefing series, which was a series of three programs um, that um, were focused on YOPD. And you can go back and watch those um, as well. They're recorded. Um, you'll see me on there a little bit more, but you can uh, some of this will be the same, but I think it never hurts to hear it over and over again. Um, but you'll also get to see some other folks that are living with living well with YOPD in addition to those that you've seen today. There are just so many amazing resources. Uh, just I encourage you to check one out here and there. Um, and I know that you can keep an eye out for even more things specific to YOPD. So I want to add that we're so, like I've said before, we're so lucky to have so many resources out there and, and to have so many rich options for folks with Parkinson's and YOPD in our community to help, help you expand your, um, your support system and your networks and your communities. But it's also really important to have a solid balance of Parkinson's and non-Parkinson's-based non activities in your lives. Remember, you are still the same person you were before you got this YOPD diagnosis, right? Your support system should be specially curated to care for you as a whole person. That includes the part with young onset Parkinson's disease, but also the you part. It really does. So thank you for that. I'd love to bring our panelists back on. Let's have a grab, drink of water. Here we come. All right, so now we've got the real experts here. Um, I would love to hear from you all. I know that everybody has different needs and, and different versions of a strong support system. 
I wonder if each of you would be able to share something that's been the most valuable part of your support system and maybe how you got involved or what inspired you to, to, to seek that out. Well, I guess I'll, I will start. I will start. Um, the, um, the, a very valuable, I would say invaluable, <laughs> very invaluable has been um, the Struthers Parkinson Center here in Minnesota, which is a center for excellence also. Um, and having a movement specialist as a doctor has been an amazing support system because the, the having a, a doctor that truly is a specialist in the area has created every other support system in my life. They've all become learners through having that uh, because not all areas of my life are aware or of how to care for people with Parkinson's. Like I think of my eye doctors, my dentist, my physical therapist, my, you know, my family practitioner, um, all those people, but having kind of like, it's almost like an ace in the pocket for me when I go to any sort of appointment. And when they know I have a specialist, you know, as a support system, they ask more questions. They don't assume, they say, you know, let me look into that or I'm going to research that further. And, and they've become learners because I have that person in my life. So that has been huge. Having the Center for Excellence and having Struthers here in Minnesota has been, I'm so fortunate, so fortunate for that. And another invaluable piece of my, um, of my support system is I have this, and I mentioned working out. Um, exercise has been a huge part of my life, huge. And prior to my diagnosis with Parkinson's, I could like take it or leave it, take it or leave it. Um, but it's become my part-time job really um, to make sure that I am exercising and moving on a regular basis. I have an amazing sister that when COVID hit, I said, I need to keep moving. I can't stop moving. Um, we need to figure out a way that I am still getting to the gym because prior to that, I'd go to the gym almost every day with a friend and, um, and having those people that support you and, and are alongside with you in doing exercise and moving is a big part of it. So every morning, Monday through Friday, we open up our FaceTime and all three of our faces, my good friends and my sister, we start our workout video at the same time and we laugh and we exercise and we move and and we're we're there for each other and and that has been such a big part of my support group is having that exercise group because I know it would be really challenging for me if I didn't have um, that team of people every morning so I consider them a big really big part of my of my support group for sure. That's awesome. And I really just admire your creative thinking. And during COVID, this is something that Anne and Jessica and I have talked a lot. It's just being so inspired by folks with Parkinson's and YOPD committed to taking care of themselves and their goals and just rethinking it. And, and so kudos to you. How about, uh, how about Greg? Um, well, my mom, for one, could we walk around the coast at now apartment complex here. Um, but I honestly walk steady. I think rock steady for me pretty much saved my life. And from the last it might have been me who might have said that uh, when I walked in, it was the first time I saw somebody that it looked just like me. It was. Um, it was you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, the guys there, I mean, from the, from day one, Greg, the, the, uh, the uh, leader at the time, walked up to me and was like, hey, you know, you want to come on in and see what's going on? I said, yeah, sure. I'm um, proud to that. I didn't really have a support system other than my mom, you know, as far as physical wise. But I saw the little tag in my neurology center. I called, got an appointment, came. And my first day, JR was one of the first people that, that welcomed me. And I mean, all the guys there were, were guys and girls, excuse me, were just so warming and so comforting. And no one judged anybody. We just, you know, we all participated. We all helped each other out. It wasn't a pity party, it was an uplifting party. And so it got, you know, it's contagious. And contagious in the most, most, most beautiful way. Um, so that alone to me is what helped me to get back to my regular self. I mean, all the guys there, you know, guys and girls there, we just one big family. And it's so funny because I stayed 25 minutes away from the gym. I stay in Durham when the gym's in Cary. When they open up another particular gym in Durham, 
uh, my mom was like, we gonna go that one? I'm like, uh, no, I my family's in Cary. <laughs> I'm not, they said, well, it's closer. I don't care. I'm like, I, I've already known those people. It's like, well, I, I can't I can't leave and go somewhere else. I don't want to. I don't, you know, my heart's not telling me to do or my heart's telling me to stay where I am, where I am. So on that level, it's just been an amazing journey. And I think for anyone who is just now becoming, you know, uh, familiar with self needs to need a support system. I think they need they need more. Cause let's say I just happened to just look at the the, the, the little billboard they had on the sheet. Um, but the fact that it's nationwide, I was going out back to Florida, and I wanted to know if I could still join a gym there. That is a beautiful help. And like I said, I think we need to just get out get out there to the to the people more information as much as possible about these groups and about other groups that are out there. So that's why I'm, I'm so privileged and honored to be a part of this family. Thanks, Greg. I really appreciate you sharing that and admiring that you tried something new that was out of your comfort zone. Um, exactly, because <laughs> I've never done anything like that before in my life. That's awesome. Dave, what about you? I realized early on that uh, physical therapy was, was really helpful in a and I was playing ice hockey at the time too. So I got into sports competitive and until recently. I don't play hockey anymore, but I play, I do biking and other things. And I do here, this is my bowling pin. <laughs> I started bowling again, just for fun. And I hit a 200 game, so I got a, I got a pin. But I don't usually hit 200, it's, it's a rare occasion. But I've, I've done a lot of uh, fun things and, and I realized how important it is to, to exercise. The strenuous exercise is important because it really makes you feel good. It's amazing how, how you feel almost normal after that. For me, it does great things. But then I never went to occupational therapy, speech therapy, all at Duke University. And it was all as a, as a group approach. It was nice to form that medical team to, to help you get better and stay on task. That's great. I and I, um, you know, I don't want to make any assumptions, but I, I hear you've made a change. You know, hockey was something that you were doing all the time. Yeah. Not doing hockey anymore, but you've got something new with bowling, and that's 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 really fantastic. Yeah. Also, thank you for mentioning that you started with the interdisciplinary care early on. I, I admit I'm a little bit biased when it comes to interdisciplinary care, um, but I I think that it's um, you know, Alicia said she felt like she had an ace in the pocket when you talked about your movement disorder center. And um, it's it's your team, it's your team. Um, and, and we're there for you. And it's for us, it's an honor to be a part of folks' team. Um, we like being there from the beginning. That's it. Well, thank you all so much for sharing and for being here. Wow, that, that was tremendous. Thank you, Allison, and all the other expert panelists who shared with us. I believe we're going to get everybody back on screen who have had a part in the program, and we're going to have some a uh, little bit more time for some final Q and A's. And so, while we're waiting for people to uh, get back on, let me go ahead and lead off with a question specifically for Dave, since he seems to be the man who has had uh, Parkinson's for the longest and has experienced a lot of haven't experienced yet because we haven't lived it as long. But uh, the first question is basically um, for you, Dave, if you knew what you know now about the course of PD, what would you have done differently? Well, that's a, that is a good question. I recognize that one. I would think back and there's some things that, uh, that weren't as, as important if, uh, as in my job. If I could take, change jobs, I was going to, but I, would, I decided not to because it would, it would disrupt the family and the income and all that. But I wouldn't imagine that I would be as, as well as I am now, that I could go on for another job and work that job. So that would be one thing. The other thing is uh, I wouldn't worry about the kids as much as I did. 
and I was worrying about them taking on the burden of my illness. And I didn't want them to feel that. And uh, they were, they've been really good. And we've had a nice relationship with the kids. But that's about, about it, I think. Okay, great. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, that, that's good for sure. Definitely good things to think about and good, good recommendations for sure. So I have another question that uh, someone wrote in for Alicia. As a college professor, professor, do you ever feel the need to explain your Parkinson's to your students or in a group or community setting? Wow, that's that's a that's a really great question. It's a really and I and I teach adult people, so I, I think the their experience with it is a little different. Um, I I do, I do sometimes. Um, I teach, um, and sometimes I don't need to. You know, it doesn't get in the way of me being successful, and and um, it doesn't come up as much. But the I teach art. To, to future educators. So a lot of times I use tools and holding tools can be really challenging. And that's been uh, probably one of the more frustrating parts of my job is, uh, you know, I was an art maker and um, it can be frustrating, but I, I always say that it's always there for me and I will find my way with it again. But when I share tools with students, I'll talk to them about how to adapt holding tools for different needs with hands. Um, so I'll say, you know, my hand, I, I struggle with being shaky and I'll tell them I struggle with stiffness and tightness and, and I tell them the fatigue in my hand and I'll share that with them and I'll show them that there are ways to hold your tools in different ways to support um, your occupational therapy part of your hands. Um, it comes up in that moment with them. Um, but, uh, you know, that I teach sophomores in college and they're still kind of centered on themselves a lot, but they... Um, you know, if they ask more, I do talk about it. There's a great artist. He, there's a whole Ted talk called embrace the shake. Um, and how he had, it was, it's not Parkinson's, but it's something um, neurological and how our limitations can make us more creative. And, and I share that with them also that, you know, even though I have the tremor and it's getting in the way of me making and creating, it's, it's caused me to think of how other ways I could be creative with. So I share that with them and share his story. Oh, great. I want to take your class. <laughs> I would love that. I would love that. <laughs> well, here's another question for Greg. You ready, Greg? I'm ready. What made you decide to have DP DBS? How has it helped you specifically? Wow. Um, <laughs> Big question. I know, right? Um, God, mom, and my symptoms. Uh, to be honest, it got to the point where I was kind of tired of, of my symptoms. Um, it was because I was I was asked about it when I came here in 2016. I was informed about it before I left to go to, before, before I left from Florida. But being you know young, big headed, think I'm take over the world. Like no, I don't need that. I'm okay. I'll be all right. It's, you know, it's no problem. But after a while, I was like, you know what? I think it's about time. Um, as far as, what was the last part of that question again? Um, how has it helped you? Oh. Specifically, give us some real tangible things. It has helped me in every way possible. Um, my speech, my personality, um, my walk, picking up things, writing, typing. I mean, it's, it's had I known this before, I would have definitely done it earlier. Um, it is it is truly phenomenal. It is brain surgery, but it's truly phenomenal. And the thing was, I wasn't scared. My doctor really talked to me. You know, he made me feel comfortable. He knew what he was doing, which is very important for people like us because I don't want to go somebody and listen. Well, you know, we're gonna try to no, I ain't gonna try. <laughs> I want you to do. But um, in every way, man, it's it's just it's like I don't want to say being normal, but it's like bringing my personality back. And a lot of people, when I first talked to them after I got my doc, after I got my operation, was like, "Man, you, you know, you're back. Your, your speech is different. You're walking tall." It's like, but to me, I hadn't noticed it until recently. I was like, "Wow, I guess I am back. My personality, just you know, because of of when he cut it on, 
for me, it was it was a straight miracle. So for anybody, I would tell them definitely, definitely, you know, especially if you're like myself, being 41, 42 years old, diagnosed, get it, just get it, you know, because it's 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 something that will change your life. Yeah, I can agree. Actually, I'm reminded, Greg, of a video I shot of you just re- just shortly after your DBS was turned on when you showed up at our boxing class. And it was like meeting the new Greg. So <laughs> absolutely incredible. Thank you for sharing. And we have a question for you. Any special advice on reassuring caregiving children? It's okay to move forward and plan for the future? That's a great question. I, you know, I think it's, it's similar to just have the discussion and talk as a family, Um, talk about um, what are the dreams and hopes of that child. And even if they're a young adult child or, um, an adult child in general, you know, they have dreams and plans and what are those? And just having an open conversation of what is holding them back. Are they worried and concerned that they have to be there for you? And, and just saying whatever it is you feel like you need, um, that, you know, what you need from them at different times is going to change. And just keeping that, they could just assume, no, I have to be here. But if you really don't feel like they need to, or there's another solution, let them know that so that they can be free to explore. I think just open communication is really important. Great, yes, I completely agree. So here's another question. Sorry, we're getting close to our our end of our program, but we're gonna continue on for a few more questions. Um, Jessica, a question for you. I'd love to learn about the best approach to tell work, people at work, my boss, et cetera. What would you suggest? It's a loaded question only because there's so many factors in it of you know, what your age is, how long you plan to keep on working, how much your symptoms impact your work. Um, so depending on where you work and also how supportive uh, or in the know people you work with are, they can make modifications and, and you have the right to ask for modifications of, um, you know, if you need more time to complete projects or if you need a different ergonomic setup at your desk, or if you need some time in your day to take a nap that would recharge you, things where you can keep doing your job uh, but just with a little bit more support and flexibility. It's, you know, I'll just say that, and that this doesn't go for everyone. And again, it's so variable, but it's usually the circumstances we see where someone doesn't tell people at work uh, that can be problematic later because sort of like what Ann was sharing about children and family and other people in your life, usually people, humans are pretty perceptive, perceptive that something's going on and people are observant and they might pick up on, they're operating a little differently. They, they are moving a little differently. They're a little slower with something. They're having a shake. And if people don't know exactly what's going on, they make assumptions and you, you, Sometimes we've seen people get in trouble or even get fired at work if they're not able to do their job that they were hired to do. But if those, if your job knew earlier on that you had Parkinson's and, you know, again, that you're able to do what you need to do with just some additional support and modifications, it usually works out better than if you withhold that and then they make the assumptions or, you know, so I don't, I don't know if it's, again, it's loaded. So I don't know if I'm answering that fully. It's just so individual, but just something to keep in mind. Um, 
that usually it tends to work out better if, if you share that a little bit earlier on than, than waiting till it's more apparent. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thanks. I personally did early on share about it and I think it averted, allowed me to avoid some uncomfortable situations later in my diagnosis at work. So yeah, thanks, Jessica. And I do agree, it is a very individualized to personal approach uh, to that and how to handle that at work. So thank you. Allison, we have a question for you. I understand that building a care team is very important. I'm so busy with work, kids, and life. How can I prioritize scheduling appointments for things like physical activity, speech therapy, when I can barely get everything else done? I hear that. I hear that. It's, it's a great question. It's a good, it's the question we all ask ourselves <laughs> probably, but for somebody with YOPD, it's, it's just a, it's a whole nother ball game. Um, before I answer that, I can't help it. I have to say that if you check out that expert briefing series from the fall, there's an entire episode um, called Work It Out um, that was about talking with your employers just for folks with YOPD. I saw some other questions about retirement, things like that coming up in the chat. So definitely check out that expert briefing. Um, sorry to do that. So um, all centers are operate a little bit differently. Sorry, I have a back, some background noise all of a sudden. All centers operate a little bit differently. Um, but if you are fortunate to have an interdisciplinary team or even a multidisciplinary team where the therapist and providers um, have access to each other and are talking to each other, that can be one, um, there's one great solution. Um, when team members talk to each other, you can let them know, this is challenging for me to fit these, fit these visits in have those assessments with the different providers, talk with them about your goals, and they can work together to help you. So in our area, for example, there are a couple locations that maybe have PT, OT, and speech on the same location. So a half day off of work is a heck of a lot easier when you can get three appointments done in one day. Now you'll be tired, <laughs> um, but that's one thing you can do. So let your team know that this is a challenge. They may have creative solutions like stacking appointments or finding a location that's closer to your office. Um, maybe it's not the one that you typically see folks at, but there could be one right around the corner. Other solutions are, um, or what I would definitely recommend is you don't have to do everything at once. Yeah, everybody here um, at the Movement Disorder Center is gonna tell you how important all the different therapies are, and they are. But the fact is that there may be something that's a little more pressing for you or that fits with your priorities and goals a little bit better. Um, so you let the team know, and then um, together they'll come up, come up with a plan. You know, I'll also just add, if your movement disorder specialist doesn't, or your neurologist or primary care doctor doesn't recommend a referral, that doesn't mean you can't benefit from it. So I'd encourage you to advocate for yourself and ask, see what it's all about. Um, I hope that answers the question. I'm happy to talk about other creative solutions um, offline. Yeah, those are definitely helpful for sure. I I'm, need to make middle note of some of those things as well. So great, thank you, Allison. Well, we're coming down to, to the home stretch. Final question, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the order of the people to answer this question. So this is for Alicia, Dave, Greg, and Deanna. So we have, so that's the order, and it's a real simple one. If you can leave everyone with one piece of final advice, what would that be? Alicia. Yes, I got mine. Um, instead of Googling it, take a walk around the block. I heard that from someone early on in my diagnosis, which helped me out a lot, you know, because I think we get really into like figuring things out. And, and they said, you're, it's more beneficial for your mind, for your body, that the minute you think about Googling something, take a loop around the block, get some exercise. Good, great, great one piece of advice. How about it, Dave? You're muted. Can you unmute, mute?
Go, Greg. You're unmuted. Greg, can you answer the question? Um, like my friend Finding Nemo, just keep swimming. Don't ever stop moving. Good, good, good advice. And Dave, you're still muted, muted so we will, uh, oh, there you are. How about one final piece of advice? My mind was keep on moving and it's not as bad as I thought they thought it would be, as I thought it would be. Great, good to remember. And Deanna. My advice would be it's a journey that none of us anticipated and I'm talking from a caregiver perspective, but you can control the journey. You can create the roadmap and all of these resources, uh, especially human resources. I think human resources are imperative for that journey that you're going on with Parkinson's and it really doesn't change you. It gives you some shakes and everything else, but you're still you and stay engaged. Great pieces of nuggets of advice for sure. Wow, we have covered a whole lot today in these two and a half plus hours. Thanks everybody for being a part of this with us. It's been tremendous. I want to thank the panelists. I want to thank the presenters and all of you for joining us today. I also want to say a special thanks to thank you to today's program sponsors, Acadia, Accorda, Amneal, Kiowa, Kieran, Synovion, and Supernus for their unwavering support. We invite you, all of you who have joined with us, to learn more about these sponsors by visiting our chapter supporters page. There you can find more information about that. So I'd just like to close us with just a few final thoughts. Your experience with PD is unique to you. This includes who you bring into the journey with you and the story that you want to tell. This is something that is in your control and you can take ownership of it. I want to encourage you to build a support system to be there for you in your PD journey. Who makes up your support system? Well, we've talked a lot about that. Family, friends, healthcare team, support group, exercise classes, et cetera, et cetera. And how they meet your needs as a person with Parkinson's disease is going to be very different is going to be different from person to person. And it may change over time, but that's okay. Overall, we want people to know that you're not alone in this journey with young onset Parkinson's disease. So on behalf of the Parkinson's Foundation, Carolina's chapter, thank you for being here today. If there were questions not answered today, which I think there were some, <laughs> don't worry. We have resources that you can contact somebody and ask those questions too. Please call our toll-free helpline at 1-800-4-PD-INFO. That's the number four and then the letters P-D-I-N-F-O. And you can also visit us online at parkinson.org forward slash Carolinas. So thank you so much for joining us. And it's a privilege to walk with you together on this journey of young onset Parkinson's disease. And we will see, uh, we will see you in the future.